welcome to episode 68 of our SAP on Azure video podcast. Today is November 18th, and together with Goran and Robert, we're here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello, everyone. Hello. So today we have Abbas Alimir joining us, who's going to show us some interesting and quite complex network connectivity and security requirements that he was working on um, with a bigger customer. And I've seen already some of his slides, and I can guarantee you this will be a very interesting deep dive in the network aspects of running SAP on Azure. But as always, before we go there, um, we'll take a quick look at some of the news from this week. And literally a few hours ago, um, SAP TechEd ended. And uh, obviously, like, like always, there's lots and lots of content that was um, presented. Um, at TechEd, we had two keynotes by one by Jürgen Müller in the in the beginning, and then another developer um, keynote with the um, team from Thomas Young. Um, I think there there was a lot of um, interesting content there, and um, similar like last year, we have an SAP TechEd news guide that talks about um, all the announcement um, that happened uh, during the last few few hours and and, and days. Um, probably one important thing is the whole announcement around um, no code, low code. I think that was a really also one of the things that um, Jürgen highlighted in his keynote. That was also part of the um, developer keynote there. So um, this this uh, low code areas is probably something um, very interesting. Um, then th there's some new announcement about obviously the, the free tier of the business technology platform um, about um, yeah, new solutions around. Um, SAP HANA, SAP HANA Cloud, the AI integration. There, there was a lot of focus on learning content and the Discovery Center, the SAP learning offerings um, that are now available. So um, unfortunately, since we, we have a long presentation coming up, we will not go too much into details here. But um, if you are interested, um, check out this um, news guide um, from, from SAP TechEd. With this, actually, let me already switch over to the next one. and. Um, Goran, I think we've been waiting for this for yeah, so a we, long we were, time. Yeah, exactly. So we are all of us, many of us, others, I'm sure that's probably as well, uh, and many customers are waiting for this feature. Actually, it's about uh, uh, file share, Azure file share, NFS file share, meaning use for the links across the zone, the zonal one, right? Uh, meaning it's it's extremely uh, helpful, and uh, we are talking about uh, high availability of of the central services. Exactly. So we had a blog announcement that we are working on in in a pre GA phase. Now it's a general availability, so a customer can use it uh, on SUSE and Red Hat with sub central services. Right. So uh, yes. this is yeah one of the general blog exactly, and I'm not sure if you have a uh, Holger I open do. there too. I like. Also. It. So we're talking about NFS. On NFS. Azure files, that, that's, on that's Azure files. Now available. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And now yeah. we can so, leverage this functionality together with our um, ACS for the for these essential file shares there. Exactly, exactly. So basically, primarily is uh, for the sub MNT, of course, for the sub uh, trans could be used also as well for the folders. I mean, of the instances as well with uh, uh, application server as well, if you want. But the point is. Customers are definitely going to the zones. That's number one. On a Linux, uh, typically you need a file share for 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 sub MNT and for uh, central services as well, and you need a zonal one. So this is really out of the box synchronized solution across the zones. Uh, failover when it happens is is fully transparent. You know, nothing need to remount it. Uh, if there is an issue in any in one of the zone, again there would be a, just a, a flip for the file share service there. So Here's an example of very detailed documentation, how install it and configure it on SUSE. Another variety is, of course, on the right hat. It's, it's basically same stuff, same stuff. And, and that's a really, really, I mean, hu huge step here um, on the Linux. On Windows, we do have uh, similar, we have uh, uh, um, SMB Azure files and share this. So let's, that, that's, that's the big GA announcement. So let's go on. Uh, yeah, the next but, but that was clear that that you need to to mention the Windows SMV file shares again. Now that we have just, just for the context, I mean, uh, yeah, You're I mean, a big fan my, my, of Windows. my Windows heart. It's it's it's. it's <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, another topic that um popped up yeah. was the proximity placement groups. Yeah, and if you if you go if you would just scroll a bit down, and we are talking about the zones, and I think that would be uh, just stop it on this picture. And maybe if you can make it a bit bigger, if possible, just to um, zoom in. 
Um, the, the point is, OK, all right. Uh -huh. So th this is the uh, previous version of the document, which is still valid. We are talking about the zones. We are talking about proximity placement group. Proximity placement group is basically a construct with bind all the SAP components physically close to each other, meaning basically in the same data center. Important is because of the latency between the application server and the database. That's the goal. Now, when you go to the zones, database and ASCS are in the zone one, but we have also multiple application servers exactly which you Typically, you use availability set. Availability set is not com compatible with the zone, so the only way to force the application server to be in the same zone is basically to use the PPG as a glue, right? So if you go to the first picture, please, uh, the initial story is um, uh, PPG was set with the database VM and then also with the central services VM and then also with the availability set where, where the app, app servers are. Sometimes there's a challenge basically that you have some a certain, uh, let's say, typically you would use M series in, in one data center, and then you would love to use, people love to use AMD VM types, which are also kind of popular because they are performance and cheap. Mm -hmm. But we might, uh, they could be available in the zone, in the same zone as a database, but maybe not in the same data center as the database VM. And what could happen either for, uh, for those uh, uh, VM types, um, when you bind them with the uh, um, with the PPG, of course, the Azure will try to or put them in the same data center. You know, and they, uh, uh, one zone consists of multiple data center. It could happen that those VMs are not in that uh, in the same data center as the database, mm. uh, and that would uh, cause an allocation failure. So basically, uh, another way approach is to make it sure if you go just scroll it down to a, a, a below picture. Uh, the point is we don't use the PPG for the database, but we just use for ASCS instance and for the app service. Yeah. So in that way, uh, what could happen basically, okay, um, typically ASCS and app service of the same VM type, so generally no issues here. They would all land, what could happen that database VM lands in one data center and the rest of the stuff lands in a, another data center, same zone, of course, uh, but still, um, because they, their, Microsoft did a lot of improvement on network latency, uh, a general expectation here that the latency still uh, would be good good enough for the SAP load kind of, um, yeah. So, and in this way, there, there is a higher probability that um, customer will not get any kind of allocation failures in such case. So both uh, um, approach are valid, so to say, and here's just a kind of, uh, make it a bit more 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 flexible, and I think that would be for the Abbas as well uh, as an intro for his part in the networking uh, to set up a little bit of context as well. Yeah. But one more thing before we hand over to Abbas, um, uh, I, I quickly want to highlight one new and old blog post I would say um, from Bartosz. So remember, um, a few weeks back um, we had talked already about Bartosz. Um, he had published um, his eight part blog series about um, using OData and how to work, um, how to extract data um, from the SAP system using OData. Um, that was a very long and detailed um, blog post series. Um, and now uh, he republished um, this blog post series here um, on the tech community on the Microsoft side. So if you missed the original blog post, or we also actually had a had a, a session with Bartosz um, on the on the podcast where he talked about the whole thing. But if you missed the original blog post, um, the series from Bartosz, now it's it's back again. Um, he's starting with part one, obviously, as always, a very very um, detailed um, content here, very much um, step by step description how to get started and. Um, obviously, it's in, yeah. When you when you remember these eight parts, I think that that was really really helpful and and showed in a nice way how you can work with OData um, and um, working on extraction scenarios. So with this um, bit of of news uh, or refreshment, um, let me actually hand hand over um, to Abbas. Um, Abbas, um, maybe you can quickly introduce yourself, talk about what you do at Microsoft, and then yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Holger and, and, and Goran, uh, Holger and Goran. This is Abbas Mir. Uh, I'm an SAP and Azure Cloud Solution Architect at Microsoft. And uh, uh, let me kind of share my screen real quick, and then you can probably you know, start going through the presentation. So just bear with me. Uh, the, the screen I'm trying to share is... 
sorry, one second. I just want to get my, my screen right, you know. We you see your uh, salary, you know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so just one second, sorry about it's just that. a joke. <laughs> so thank you. So again, uh, you know, today we in today's session, we intend to cover uh, uh, the complex networking solutions for some of our large SAP and Azure customers that they have gone live and implemented these solutions. And these are the we talk, Fortune 50 uh, customer references, which we're going to be leveraging uh, today in our discussion. Uh, so before we go deep dive into the networking aspects of it, I just want to touch upon the architecture that was implemented for one of the customers. Uh, it was an SAP stress cluster deployment across two availability zones uh, with a cross region DR solution. Now, uh, our customer uh, reference basically implemented an SAP S4 HANA greenfield deployment in Azure. But this architecture, which you're seeing over here, also applies to any brownfield lift and shift deployments from on premises to Azure, any bluefield, which is kind of a hybrid between you know, going completely brownfield versus going completely new with greenfield. Uh, it also will apply to any deployments which are like NetViewer with any DB. Or if you're doing in a suite on HANA deployments with ECC, or you're doing in BW on HANA or BW for HANA or S4 for HANA, pretty much any of those deployments you can think of can be can leverage this architecture, uh, which is shown here. It also applies to your Windows deployments, Linux deployments as well. So I think real quick, we'll just kind of walk through the architecture drawing here. So in our case, uh, from an SAP application technical component standpoint, we'll go bottom up. There was an SAP application database, which was the HANA database that was deployed across two nodes, X being the primary, Y being the secondary. We use the uh, synchronous HANA system replication to have a zero RPO between X and Y nodes. And then we use the asynchronous DB replication to kind of replicate out to the Z node as part of the DR uh, strategy. There was a uh, redundant zone redundant Azure load balancer that was used to kind of load balance the traffic to X and Y nodes for connect for the app servers to be able to connect to the database. Keep in mind that we did turn on floating IP air, uh, enabled on this capability uh, on the load balancer. This will allow for direct server return, which basically means when other traffic is coming in from the application tier to the database, it only goes to the load balancer for the initial communication. All of the subsequent communication from the app tier to the database happens directly. It does not go through the load balancer. So it's not a bottleneck for subsequent communication. Then if you go further up the stack, we have the SAP central services, which is the ASCS uh, for ABAP and SCS for Java and the ERS that was split across two uh, zones, AZ1 and AZ2. And I this is really, I think I should have started with that. This is the primary region with South Central US region and the, which is, and then you've got the East US region is the secondary region. And we are talking about AZ1 and AZ2 in the South Central US region and the availability zone in the secondary US region. So my, so my bad on that. So again, you know, going back, X and Y nodes are deployed across two availability zones for the database layer. For the central services, we have the, uh, the ASCS for ABAP and SCS for ERS, uh, SCS for Java, and the ERS split across the two zones using a load balancer, zone and load balancer for the ASCS and the ERS nodes. Now, for both the HANA database, we, uh, we were using the pacemaker cluster on SUSE Linux uh, at the OS level clustering sol solution, and same thing with the ASCS, SCS, and ERS. We use the pacemaker cluster solution as an OS level clustering solution. There is a shared file system storage that is required between the SAP central services and the SAP application servers. This is more for the SAP mount, which hosts your mm -hmm. EXE executables. It hosts your profiles for the profiles, you know, files, and it also has the global for the job logs and what and other things. And then you have the transports directory. You have the interfaces directory, which are being shared across with the application servers and the central services. Now for this. Shared file system storage, we have multiple offerings within Azure. You could use NFS over AFS, which Goran and Holger kind of pointed out in earlier. You could use ANF storage, and you could, and prior to the services being available, customers used to also set up storage clusters on VMs, where you would set up an NFS cluster on VMs, or, a, uh, or you know, you even do like a Windows scale out file server using Windows storage spaces direct, uh, and with, with Windows failover clustering. Now, uh, keep in mind that when the slight difference between the Azure file premium file service and ANF Azure premium file service is a synchronous storage, which means that that storage is basically synchronously 
made available to you across all three zones. So whenever you write or do a commit, it's actually writing to all the three zones. And that's the storage is the same storage you will access across three zones. Whereas ANF is a replicated storage where you basically stand up an ANF volume in AZ1, another ANF volume in AZ2, and then you have to probably you have to use some sort of replication technology like R Sync or Cloud Sync to replicate that. In our case, in our customer reference, the ANF was used uh, for this ANF shared storage, and that was mounted to onto the SAP Central Services and the SAP application servers. Coming to the application servers, we uh, you know deployed a bunch of application servers in AZ1 and AZ2, and they were deployed in an availability set to ensure that. Uh, they go on to uh, separate fault and update domains. Then we, of course, had the web dispatches deployed into two ability zones, and they were deployed to load balance the traffic HTTP and HTTPS onto the app servers. What is not show, shown here is an SAP GUI, which typically is on an on-premises user laptop that basically is used to kind of connect to the uh, ACS SCS message server, which actually you know does the load balancing onto the app servers for the uh, for, for the SAP GUI communication. Now, for for one central ERP system, basically, or was this the the, the pattern here now for for multiple SAP systems? What was the question? This? Yeah, so basically, there were sixteen SAP systems that were deployed, oh. and they used the same uh, same construct we're showing as a cross zone stretch cluster. Mm -hmm. right? What do we have? We had S S four, we had BW, CRM, Ihana, oh, cool. Portal, Fiori. Uh, Solman, just to name a few, you know. So there was a lot of uh, SAP applications that were deployed using the same uh, high availability and disaster recovery pattern. Mm. So now, uh, also there are. I will finish on the on the DR, and then I'll come back and talk about some of the key, you know, uh, uh, flows within this architecture, uh, which are important for an, from an SAP deployment. From a DR standpoint, we use the Azure Site Recovery for uh, replicating out the web dispatcher, the the app server VMs, and the the central services, and then we use the asynchronous DB replication HANA HSR for the Y to Z database. Now. Uh, for the storage, it depends, right? And in case of ANF, you could use ANF cross-region replication, which can be used to kind of replicate the storage from the source to the target. But if you're using Azure Premium File Service, then we don't have a native replication technology today. You will have to use RSync or some third-party solutions like Commvault or Rubrik to perform the same. Uh, now, there are two important uh, uh, key things to note that when an app server communicates to the database, SAP mandates that the network latency should be 0.7 milliseconds or less, and that does you know pose challenges at times. So in this case, uh, what we typically do is that we use a proximity placement group to ensure that the app server to database communication always uh, is you know within that 0.7 millisecond latency. So in the past architectures, we would used to have a PPG where it would kind of encompass the app servers, the central services and the database all together in one PPG. And we would use the database nodes X and Y as the anchor nodes for PPG one in AZ one and the Y would become the anchor node for PPG two proximity investment group in in, in availability zone two. And this was the architecture we used to have, and that's how our customer has also implemented it. Uh, now keep in mind the other important construct to note is that when you're doing the Cross zone stretch cluster architecture, you got to know that not all Azure regions have same cross availability zone latency. Some have lower latency versus others. So, where it is applicable, you can have app servers in one zone talk to the database in the other zone uh, where it is acceptable with that and holding around 0.7 millisecond latency. And if it's not the case, then you would have to have the app servers in the other zone dormant app servers and you basically bring them up whenever the X fails over to Y or you accept the the uh, you know performance uh, being degraded for a short period of time where you kind of fail back from y to x mm -hmm. so that's how the the pattern you know you would typically use uh, in our case the customer had the app servers up and running in both availability zones and they use the logon groups the sap logon groups the rfc groups and the batch server groups to perform the switch wherever the x kind of failed over to y the logon groups were switched so that subsequent communication coming in from the users to the App servers was actually, you know, using the app servers in the same zone wherever the database was active. The the one thing which has now come as a more recent document that uh, that the team alluded to earlier was this one, where the the database servers now do not need to be part of the PPG because some of the net more network uh, performance improvements we have done for intra availability zone communication, where within an availability zone. Uh, we have a strong understanding that the app servers can talk to the database with 0.7 milliseconds or less latency. And customers can, of course, test it out, but we believe there is no need to have the database servers as part of the PPG anymore. Uh, we do still need the PPG for the app 
to and the central services. The reason being that the app servers are in an availability set and uh, to ensure that they are, you know, kind of in separate fault domains and update domains, you need to have an availability set. Otherwise, the, all the app servers could land on a single physical hypervisor host, which we don't want. And that's the reason we still want to use the PPG construct. So, in so that was what, what I was mentioning basically in this uh, as a new as an update on, on the official documentation, actually, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, Great. totally agree. Yes. So with this, I think uh, the big advantage of doing this is that if you have the database servers, you know, you can easily upgrade to newer uh, M series and whatnot and not have to, you know, kind of have a dependency on the networking constraint that the PPG enforces where it has to be part of the same T2 spine switch in us in a data center. I think with that, uh, the one more thing I want to talk about is the backups real quick. On the backup side of things, we use the Azure VM backup uh, solution for all of the VMs. Uh, and we used uh, the we use rubric for the ANF storage backups. And for the database, uh, the Dell DD Boost solution was used. Having said that, we also have a native Azure backup for HANA solution customers can use. And as I mentioned earlier, if the architecture were for other, some of the customers was not using HANA, it was using Oracle. In that scenario, also you will do the same pattern. You will have X and Y as a primary and the secondary with Oracle Data Guard solution, and you will use the Oracle's fast uh, start failover with Observer VM to perform the node arbitration. Uh, uh, and you would use the asynchronous database replication to go out to the uh, using Oracle Data Guard to replicate to the, to the uh, secondary region. If you're using SQL Server, then you would use the SQL Server always on clustering uh, solution with synchronous database replication across X and Y, and you'll use the asynchronous database replication going to Z. Of course, for the X and Y, you'll also use the Windows Server failover cluster mechanism along with it. But this kind of you know, kind of sums up the architectural design patterns, which typically you will see with all of the SAP and Azure deployments, and we'll go into the network networking aspects. So here's where the customer came up with some stringent networking connectivity and security requirements that we had to kind of you know, design a solution around. And they had five basic major principles. Any communication from internet to SAP on Azure has to go through a packet inspection firewall, which means you could use a Palo Alto firewall or you could use an Azure firewall. So in a sense, what they were saying is that it has to be a firewall network which will appliance. It cannot be a network security group, which is an ACL based firewall, which is based on the five tuple, you know, source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and protocol. It has to be a, a network virtual appliance. In our case, customer was using the Palo Alto firewall, so I'll keep referencing this firewall as a Palo Alto firewall in, in, in all the future slides. The other thing they also had, the second rule number two was any communication from on premises to SAP on in Azure has to go through a firewall. The third rule they had was that any non SAP workloads or networks in Azure talking to SAP in Azure also have to go through a firewall, the Palo Alto firewall. That was their requirements. The only exceptions they had was the any communication within an SAP environment, for example, within a dev environment like the app servers talking to the database or a QA environment or within the QA environment or within the production environment can leverage NSGs. No need to have a firewall. And again, you know, when you have an app server to database communication, we do not allow any NVA appliances in between for the request flow as well. The last was, you know, if you're going from dev environment to QA or from QA to production or from dev to production, there has to be a firewall, a, a network virtual appliance. That was the requirement. So the, the architectures which we present are kind of adhering to these five design principles that were laid down by our, by our customer. We start out with the lay of the land of how we started looking at the design. And uh, in a sense, uh, then we build up on the slide going forward. So in the middle, you see the internet shown in the red box, and then you see the on-premise customers data centers, one in Texas, other one in Virginia, and they were using the uh, express route circuits in the Equinix Colo facilities in Dallas, uh, as well as in Washington, D.C., to allow established connectivity from on-premise data centers into Azure. There are two Azure regions shown over here, the South Central U.S. region, which is the primary region, and the East U.S. region, which is the secondary region. And you can see that uh, it, the customer had a uh, traditional hub and spoke uh, network uh, topology model, but it can easily be you know, substituted with a uh, virtual van design if customers wanted to use a virtual van instead of a hub and spoke architecture. But in this in this hub virtual network, we had uh, uh, Azure application gateway, which was really kind of you know filtering out any layer seven inbound traffic coming into Azure on both sides, South Central as well as in East US. You had that Azure, Azure application gateway. You had a Palo Alto firewall solution deployed as well in the hub vnet, which was pretty much you know, ensuring that all of the traffic that is routing from uh, or north south traffic from internet or from on premises coming into Azure has to route through this Palo Alto firewall. And likewise, any traffic which is within the region 
uh, or cross region uh, is also going through this uh, Palo Alto firewall, which is the east west traffic was also going through the Palo Alto firewall. Then we had the express route gateway that was really kind of linking to the express route circuits of the customer to ensure that other there is connectivity from uh, Azure regions, South Central and East US into on premise data centers. And likewise, the on premise data centers can talk into Azure regions through this express route connectivity on both sides. Now, beyond the hub VNet, we had a bunch of spoke VNets. There were a, a bunch of non SAP spoke VNets, was, was hosting some of the non SAP workloads. And then we had the SAP spoke VNets, which are shown in this kind of box in here. And this SAP spoke VNets with environment uh, specific, like a dev VNet, a production VNet. And we also had a, uh, an, an, a QA VNet, which was like an SAP spoke VNet. And then we had the mini hub VNet, which we created more so to host some of the shared SAP components, like Cloud Connector to connect to the SAP Cloud Platform or the SAP BTP, which is a business technology platform. The SAP router was to connect to the SAP support. We had WTS servers to kind of log into uh, for your admins to be able to log in through, through this to the SAP servers. And then we have ANF storage. This was more to kind of you know host your SAP mount, uh, you know, uh, common uh, file systems, and then of course uh, for transports, for uh, interfaces, and also for the SAP CD, you know, which is used to kind of host the SAP software. And those VNets are, I guess, peered, connected to each other. Yeah, that's so the, yes. The next slide will kind of talk about the the connectivity to this. This is kind of yes, yeah. laying down the virtual networks in Azure, and the next one will focus on how we are really interconnecting all of this. And as I said, how I described the South Central US region, the East US also had a hub VNet and a bunch of spoke VNets with non SAP VNet and the SAP VNets being the QA VNet and the mini hub. As you can see that there are three system landscape here with the dev, QA and production. The dev also kind of doubled up as a dual purpose DR solution so that it was also kind of used. The QA HANA VM was actually also hosting not only the QA database, but also the DR database on it. The next slide is kind of, you know, Starts to kind of build on the on all the connectivity pieces, as you asked, Gordon. So on the in, on the internet side of things, we the red boxes, red lines are basically saying that this is a sh the connectivity you're having from internet into Azure and from Azure to the internet, and all of this connectivity is going through this Palo Alto firewalls that are deployed in each of the regions: South Central US region and the East US region. Also, you can see that the express route uh, gateway in the hub VNet is now linking to both the Dallas and the Washington DC express route circuit. Uh, as well as the express route gateway in the East US region is linking to the Dallas Ex and Washington express route circuits. This is purple lines. What these purple lines are basically saying is that you have connectivity from South Central US region and East US region into the on-premise data centers, and the on-premise data centers are using the same express route connectivity to connect to South Central and East US regions. Now coming to this green lines on the left are really the regional VNet peerings that we are establishing. So all of the spoke VNets, the non-SAP and the SAP spoke VNets are using the VNet peering to peer with the hub VNet. And we also have the environment VNets, the SAP dev and the production peer with the SAP mini hub to take advantage of the shared SAP components over there. The same thing you see on the right hand side that the, all of the non SAP, all of the sorry, the spoke VNets, the non SAP and the SAP VNets appear through the green line to the hub VNet. And then the environment VNet, the QA VNet is peered to the mini hub as well. Also, a customer, what they did was that they created like a hub mesh architecture where all of, each of the regions were interconnected to the other region through the Palo Alto firewalls using the global VNet peering solution. So what they did was that this global VNet peering one is really set up across the hub VNet in South Central US region to the hub VNet in the East US region. The idea behind this global VNet peering was that any communication that happens cross region from South Central US to East US and from East US to South Central US always goes through this blue line which is the global VNet peering. And the communication is always traversed through the, both the firewalls. Take an example that you're trying to promote code and configuration through the transport layer from the dev QA VNet app servers in the app subnet to the SAP QA VNet app servers. These are RFC calls that are happening between the app servers in QA VNet to the app servers so the app servers in dev VNet to the app servers in the QA VNet. And this communication would basically flow through this SAP dev VNet to the Palo Alto firewall in South Central, go through this blue line to the Palo Alto firewall in East US region and come all the way to the SAP QA VNet. That was the request for the transport layer. Now, the second blue line you see is the global VNet peering too that we specifically enabled from the prod VNet to the SAP QA VNet. And that was for the database 
uh, HANA database replication from, uh, and we're going to talk about this in a bit more in this few subsequent slides, but that was the only communication that was allowed to this blue line, direct blue line. All the other communication from prod to QA VNet still had to go through the Palo Alto firewalls and through the hub VNets across the two regions. Think with this, I will kind of go to the next slide, which kind of builds up on top of this, where we kind of now laying out the subnets for each of these VNets. As you can see in the middle, we still see the internet. We know there is this hub mesh architecture with a global VNet peering between the two hub VNets. We have the express route connections, which allow the South Central and the East US region to connect to the on premises that we discussed. And uh, we also have the global VNet peering too, which is really to allow the HANA system replication communication from the production database to the DR database uh, cross region. With that said, let's kind of focus on the hub VNet uh, subnet. So on the hub VNet, we had the application gateway subnet. It was hosting the Azure application gateway. Uh, now I know some customers or some ask questions around Azure application gateway getting kind of brought into the spoke VNets. I think it's really at the discretion of the customers if they want to do it. But typically what we have seen is this, this external Azure application gateways are managed by centralized IT and they try to keep it into the hub VNet in a shared subscription and not push it over into the SAP spoke VNets. Uh, the, the, and then we got the PA firewall and it has comes, it has a bunch of subnets. You got the, the trusted, untrusted and the management uh, subnets that are kind of you know deployed for hosting the Palo Alto firewall solution. We have the gateway subnet, which is using the uh, having the express route gateway deployed in it. And there are other bunch of shared you know, components like you have domain controllers, you could have you know, a jump servers and whatnot that get deployed under these other subnets here. On the non SAP VNet, it's like we kept it general, you know, where you have non different non SAP workloads which have their own subnet requirements. So we're just calling it subnet one and two. Coming to the SAP subnets, we are kind of showing the SAP mini hub and the production subnet here. We skip the the dev uh, VNet here because kind of, you know, a lot of taking up too much of real estate on this drawing, but you can imagine it is also part of this architecture. On the SAP mini hub VNet, we have an SAP shared sub subnet, which basically hosts your cloud connector, SAP router, and WTS service. And then as I said, we have an ANF subnet here, which will host your SAP mount, transports, uh, interfaces, uh, uh, file systems, and SAP CD for the software. On the SAP environment VNet, we have a web VNet a subnet, which basically hosts your web dispatchers and the load balancer, which is used to load balance the web dispatchers. And, the, and then on the app subnet, we have the app servers and the central services, ASCS or SCS and the ERS servers, all deployed onto the app servers. It also loads, the, it also hosts the Azure load balancer for the ASCS and the ERS uh, uh, you know, uh, services. Then we have the database subnet, which is hosting our HANA VMs. And the Azure Load Balancer, which is you know front ending the HANA VMs, uh, was in the database subnet. Now the ANF subnet local to an environment like production or dev or QA is not necessarily required, but our customer wanted to have an ANF subnet here, uh, so that they just they can they can you know drop some things in here locally in that particular environment. Having said that, even if you have a centralized ANF subnet, we have capabilities like the ANF uh, volumes export policies that you can use to control which client VMs are able to uh, you know, kind of mount those ANF volumes. And that is the security mechanism we have today because ANF is really an injected, VNet injected service that we deploy into a VNet uh, 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 managed subnet. So currently there is, you cannot apply NSGs or UDRs to an ANF subnet, uh, but in future there are improvements that are coming in on the ANF side that will allow you to actually uh, create and uh, provision um, uh, NSGs and, and associate with the ANF subnet and use UDRs as well going forward. Whatever I described in the South Central US region, you know, remains the same in the East US region as we have a hub in the VNet with the same bunch of subnets, and then we have the non SAP VNet and the SAP mini hub and the SAP. Uh, you know, uh, QA VNet over here with the same set of uh, subnets, web, app, database, and ANF subnet. I think with that, I think uh, one thing also, because the, the Palo Alto firewall solution is such an important solution in this architecture because all of the traffic is pretty much routing through it. I think they, our customer was very diligent, you know, kind of setting up a huge, you know, uh, 10, 9 or 10, you know, large E-series VM, you know, uh, cluster, which kind of, you know, provides you with 40 gigabits per, uh, per uh, second throughput, network throughput, and I think they're due, diligently monitoring it to ensure that it does not get overloaded, you know, and they, uh, for the for the SAP deployments. With that, I think the next slide kind of talks about the security with network security groups and user-defined routes. So 
NSGs were applied to each of the subnets in the SAP uh, side of things to ensure that we control the intra VNet traffic, you know, as well. So, for example, there was an uh, NSG applied to the SAP shared subnet uh, here to ensure that the, the right entities are able to communicate here. And then the ANF subnet, as I mentioned earlier, cannot have any NSGs at this point, so we did not apply NSGs there for the SA, and we use the ANF export policies to control the ANF volume access. The SAP environment VNet had a NSGs for the web subnet, app subnet, and database subnet. The key thing in here is that all of the communication going from web to app or from app to database was all controlled through the NSGs, network security groups. Now, there were a lot of other external entities from on premises that needed to communicate to these systems, and the customer had some idea, but not a whole lot of you know, understanding of how to really put all the rules in one place. So they used an approach of NSG uh, log and learn, which is logging first and not creating rules. So once they log for a bit few, for a month or so, they they were able to understand all the request flows in the logging, and then they started going and applying all the rules so that it did not, you know, was not disrupted to the user base uh, of what are their developers uh, in the in the project phase. The other important aspect was the user defined routes, and this is really where, you know, we were able to kind of suffice the customer security requirements primarily by using the right user defined routes in the route tables and there's route tables associated at a subnet level. The key things we did was this was we had a common blue route table that we applied to most of the SAP you know, spoke VNet subnets with the exception of one database subnet here. So this what this light blue route table did was that it basically ensured that any traffic going from these SAP networks, which is the blue you know, on, on the very left you see, let's say it was going to the non SAP VNets, we made sure that through the routing table, we forced the traffic through the Palo Alto firewall here to non SAP. Any traffic going to hub VNet will go through the Palo Alto firewall. Any traffic from this blue SAP networks going to internet also had to go through the Palo Alto firewall. Any traffic going from these SAP VNets to on premises also had to go through the blue, uh, to, to, to this uh, Palo Alto firewall here. Any traffic going from SAP networks to, let's say, cross region. To either SAP or non SAP also had to go through both the Palo Alto firewalls in South Central US region and the East US region Palo Alto firewalls to get to the other side. And uh, the only exception to this not using a Palo Alto firewall was if the traffic was contained within the VNet, like web or app subnet talking to the database subnet, will use the NSGs or the HANA system replication traffic going from the production uh, database uh, VNet database subnet to the uh, QA VNet database subnet. That was the only traffic we let that go directly. Now, if, if we, I don't have a dev VNet to show over here, but if the traffic was there, let's say there was dev VNet was trying to talk to the production VNet, that traffic also would go through this Palo Alto firewall in the South Central US region. To pick on a couple of request flows and just walk through you know, how the traffic would, would come in and go, let there was a PO system which would, you know, initiate, uh, there was internet initiated traffic coming in for the PO. Uh, process orchestrator system the traffic would coming from the internet it'll go to the uh, azure application gateway in the app gateway subnet it'll go to the palo alto firewall and from there the top traffic will come in all the way to the uh, the process orchestrator system which was deployed in a, uh, the production vnet as well as in the other environment sap vnets now if there was an uh, sap support trying to call in that would come in through the internet to the uh, Follow all the firewall here directly, and it'll basically it wasn't using an HTTP HTTPS traffic, it was non uh, you know HTTP traffic. It'll come through the Palo Alto firewall and kind of kind of come through from there to the SAP shared subnet where we will have the SAP router and kind of from there it'll really establish connectivity to the SAP system that it was trying to do troubleshooting on. Other request flow, as I said, was a transports request flow, which was like imagine you were trying to promote code and configuration from QA to production. That traffic would be an RFC call from the app subnet in the QA to the app subnet in production. And this communication will go from app subnet in QA to the Palo Alto firewall in the East US region. It will go through this blue line, uh, global unit leading to the Palo Alto firewall in South Central US region. And from there, it will come all the way to the app subnet, which is in the production VNet. If it was that was the light blue route table, which was doing all of that stuff. Then we also had a dark blue route table for the database subnet and this what it was ensuring that all of the traffic which goes from database subnet in production to database subnet in QA would go over this HANA global VNet peering, which we have set up for specifically for the HANA system replication. That was being used. Now, having said that, uh, this was the only communication we were allowing over HANA uh, over, uh, over this global VNet peering. If 
there was communication required, let's say from the ZW subnet to any of the other subnets in this QAV net, that traffic will always take the hub mesh route, which is going through the two Palo Alto firewalls in the South Central and East West. For example, imagine there was this this app subnet in QA trying to talk to the database subnet over here, it'll use the Palo Alto route, uh, global mesh route over there. Likewise, so, and web or app subnet, go ahead. Yeah, so basically this is also good for from security perspective to separate it, but uh, I'm sure also from performance perspective that HANA has its own uh, dedicated VNet peering uh, and nobody would use it, but just the HANA, right? Absolutely, that that was the the real reason to ensure, and then a customer ins, in, insisted that they did not want the Hano system replication to go through the Palo Alto firewall solution, and SAP also was uh, not in favor of going through the Palo Alto firewalls for HSR replication as well. So we used this architecture approach, and I think it worked well uh, at our customer, which has gone live uh, with this implementation. Now. I think uh, with that said, we will switch gears and we'll we have talked about VM architectures and these architectures, you know, will work on any SAP and Azure implementation that we have a customer will like to you know, kind of move forward with. Now we're talking, we're bringing in the HANA large instances and HANA large instances is really our bare metal offering in Azure and it has had some, you know, advantages, you know, in that Azure VMs currently have a max VM size of 12 terabyte, so it can only support up to 12 terabyte HANA databases, whereas the HANA large instances, which is a bare metal offering, can support up to 24 terabyte uh, HANA databases in Azure. It also has uh, an HLI Optane uh, persistent memory capability, which allows you to do HANA fast restarts and that kind of you know can, can come in handy uh, and is important to some of the customers you know the, in trying to restart the HANA databases much more quickly than a traditional approach. Uh, but before I talk about how we bring in HLI into Azure, I do want to talk about a couple of capabilities that are important to the HLI networking. One of them is called Express Route Global Reach. What it does is that it allows you to link Express Route circuits together so you can link Express route circuit, for example, is a sample slide. Uh, an express route circuit is in Tokyo. You got another uh, front ending some uh, data centers, and you got another express route circuit in Hong Kong, uh, front ending some of your branch offices or back end data centers. And let's say you have another express route circuit in Silicon Valley. What you can do is that using express route global reach capability, you can interconnect all of these express route circuits together. And once you do that, all of the data centers which are behind these express route circuits are automatically interlinked to each other through the express route global reach you know now we are microsoft global backbone network so now a data center in tokyo can talk to a data center in us and likewise a data center in hong kong can talk to another data center in us and vice versa so that's what the express route global reach capability does it's really not competing but it's really complementing your service providers man implementation now we also have another capability called express route fast path so before i Talk about this capability. Let's kind of touch upon a couple of things an Express Route Gateway provides. So, Express Route Gateway, as you know, is deployed into a virtual network in a gateway subnet, and we link an Express Route Gateway to, say, an on premises Express Route circuit to really allow on premises to Azure connectivity. There are two primary functions an Express Route Gateway does. One is a route network exchange, which in a sense means that it's basically allowing you to exchange the routes from Azure virtual networks, which it passes on to the on-premises side, and all of the BGP and other routes that are advertised from on-premises are being learned by the Express Route Gateway. What this helps with you is that it helps you with the second function that Express Route Gateway does, which, is, which it does is called network uh, routing. So in a sense, routing network traffic. So a VM in Azure now is able to, through the Express Route Gateway, talk to a VM on-premises. Likewise, an on-premises VM can talk through the Express Route Gateway into an Azure VM, which is great, but it also introduces a bottleneck because now Express Route Gateway is in the path for this data traffic flowing from one VM on premises to another VM in Azure. And Express Route Gateway also is running on a bunch of VMs and it basically has a 10 gigabits per second uh, network throughput limit. This can become a problem when you're doing some massive network, uh, sorry, massive data ingestion, let's say from on premises to Azure or vice versa. And to solve for this problem, the express route fast path is used and what it does is that it it still uses the express route gateway for the route exchange for route exchanging routes between on premises and azure but for the data communication it's used it bypasses or skips the express route gateway and goes direct so now let's say you're doing a massive data ingestion from on premises to azure you go through this data plane which is direct and this kind of go all the way up to 100 gigabits per second network throughput so it's kind of huge improvement you know uh, and kind of removes the the limitation which uh, of the network throughput that the gateway has with 10 gigabits per second so with that i think that 
we kind of jump into the how we bring in the HLI into uh, the networking. Uh, uh, so I'll start out slowly to kind of you know build on the slide. So you see on the very right is the customer on-premise data center, and then the customer use using the customer's on-premise express route circuit to connect into Azure, which is the green box here, which is South Central US region. Also, the internet is shown as red box with the red line coming in and connecting into the hub virtual network through the Palo Alto firewall into Azure. And I believe yeah. uh, I believe the HLI is the, this new version, which is basically located inside of the Azure data center, right? Not not in some, correct? Correct. Very very good. You know, point, uh, Goran. So when we started out with the HLI a long time back, HLI was initially deployed into the Equinix School of Facilities, correct. facilities correct. and uh, yeah. and uh, Azure was running in uh, VMs were running in our own Azure data centers. But then going as we move progress forward. We now have HLI deployed into our own data centers, uh, and it is not anymore in the Equinix School of Facilities. Which, uh, which improves the latency to, towards hugely, the server, exactly, yeah. Hugely, I mean, so absolutely. So going to, the, so to, you know, kind of expanding on the South Central US region, you have the hub virtual net network, as we described in the previous slides. It has the Azure application gateway for inbound layer seven traffic. We have the Palo Alto firewall for the north, south, and the east, west traffic, and we got the express route gateway to link uh, to on-premises and and then we also have the non-SAP spoke units which appear to the green uh, line uh, to hub VNet and we have the SAP spoke units which are hosting the SAP app servers and other things uh, appeared through the VNet peering to the hub VNet. So when you peer the, the spoke units which is non-SAP and the SAP spoke units to the hub VNet, we use the use remote gateway and the allow gateway transit options to be able to leverage the express route gateway here in the hub VNet. The, now coming then, as, as Goran pointed out, the HLI is in our own Azure data centers in the South Central US region in this example. But HLI is a bare metal offering, so it does not get deployed or placed into a virtual network. It kind of gets placed into a VLAN uh, as a traditional you know, data center construct. And in this, in this case, we're showing the HLI database node one and node two, you know, kind of belonging to the same VLAN one. And when you do that, for it to be able to talk to the Azure virtual networks, it needs to use an express route circuit, uh, which is front ending, and we call it an HLI express route circuit, which is front ending the HLI. Uh, and for you to connect to this HLI express route circuit through your Azure virtual networks, you'll have to do the same thing as you do for on premises. You have to take the express route gateway in the hub VNet and link it to the HLI express route circuit. But when you're doing that, we are kind of you know also enabling the fast path on the express route connection. It's like a toggle. When you do that, you kind of unlock you know that the express route is used. Gateway is used to kind of for the route exchange, but no more for the data path. So when the app servers in here are kind of communicating with the database, it's using the fast path connection where it can kind of you know um, go all the way up to 100 gigabits per second, you know, in terms of network throughput. It's not limited by the 10 gig with the Express Route Gateway offers. Now, so let's having said that, let's walk through some of the request flows, you know, which and then uh, which happen. If the SAP app servers need to talk to the HLI, they're going to use this green and line to to the VNet peer to the hub VNet, they will use the express route gateway over here to use this express route connection too to connect to HLI. So no challenges, simple, straightforward connectivity. And we have kind of you know enabled the ER fast path connectivity for the peered VNets, which became GA very recently. So this allows the app service to actually take advantage of the fast path connectivity to connect through this. And if this you had also not go through the firewall, right? So so these calls yes. from the application server to the database don't go through the firewall. Absolutely, they, they go directly using the express route gateway uh, mm -hmm. connectivity mm -hmm. and uh, actually for the data path, the communication is not even go through, going through the gateway. It's going direct from the app service yeah. to the yeah. to the HLI nodes, you know, through the express route circuit. Uh, that's the communication we have. And this is a dedicated HLI circuit for every customer, so they have their own, you know, 10 gig circuit that they can leverage uh, on, uh, on, on uh, in here. Now, having said that, if you have the non SAP spoke units communicating to the HLI, they will come through the hub VNet express route gateway through this peered connection and then they come in, come in all the way in and talk to the HLI. If you have the internet coming in, the internet will come through the hub VNet, through the Palo Alto firewall to the express route gateway and coming all the way to the HLI. Now, some customers also want the on premises to be able to talk to the HLI. Maybe they are doing some data loads or something of the sort, and they need that connectivity from on premises to be able to establish directly to the database uh, running in, on, on, on the HLI. For that, 
you would the best solution is to really do the, use the ER global reach, which we talked about to interlink or interconnect the express route circuit. So you take the on premise express route circuit and you connect it to the HLI express route circuit. When you do that, the on premise data centers now uh, the users can basically use this dark purple line at the bottom to actually connect to the HLI. And of course, they could use the firewalls if they needed that firewall to be. They can use a firewall in on premises. They can use a firewall in the Equinix Colo facility or the Express Route Edge to use there, or they can also use a, a, a like we have an OS level Linux IP tables firewall available on the HLI nodes as well to kind of enable that communication. Now this architecture is great, you know, and I think this is what I think we really want our customers to be using it. There is one thing that can be a cause of concern for customers, and we want to bring it up that the non SAP spoke units when they want need to talk to the HLI. They go direct to the express route gateway and talk to the HLI. There is no way for us to force this traffic to go through the Palo Alto firewall here. You 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 will have the traffic going directly to the HLI. You can use the OS level Linux IP tables firewall as of today to block that traffic and you can potentially use NSGs on the non SAP spoke units as well to block it. But there is that the Palo Alto in the hub unit cannot be used until this capability comes through. There's a UDR support for the express route uh, fast path connections that is in development. And when this capability becomes available, then you can force this traffic to go through the Palo Alto firewall. Till then, you know, that is one thing to be aware of. But by and large, this is, a, this is, a, this is an absolutely, you know, uh, the right architecture and the most simplified architecture, I would say, to enable when you have HLI in the mix along with other Azure deployments. So with with that, uh, questions? No, I, I was just smiling. The most simple architecture, but it looks already fairly complicated with all the <laughs> um, components and connections. Yeah, I mean, like the HLI being a bit more laughing, you know, this sure. is where, you know, yeah, we, we have to, we're not going to work through and it. And this is a big picture, you know, so you zoom out and then you see a lot of components there. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. So I think this is where the, the architecture is. The second architecture is, let's say the customer is a little bit, you know, unwilling that non-ACP spoke units have a direct access to HLI mm -hmm. until this new new capability comes through. Then you could potentially use this option too, where, you know, what you're doing in here is that, is the same architecture as drawn as previously, where you have the customer's data center at the Dallas Express Route Edge. You got the internet coming in, the non SAP spoke units appearing to the hub vnet, and the SAP spoke units also appearing to the hub vnet. But in this scenario, the you will not be using the use remote gateway and allow gateway transit options uh, to connect to this express route gateway anymore. You will have a dedicated express route gateway for, for the SAP spoke units. Now in our architecture, you could deploy this express route gateway in like, like an SAP mini hub if you choose. And if customers don't want it, they can deploy an express route gateway in each of the SAP spoke units. The advantage of this architecture is that now the SAP spoke units can obviously use their own express route gateway to talk to the HLI using the ER fast path connection to over here. Uh, and also the non SAP units no more have a direct access to HLI. They are going to go through the hub vnet firewall to connect through this ex express route connection four, which is uh, through the express route gateway over here to connect over to the HLI. So there is control over the non SAP VNets to be able to connect to HLI. The internet connectivity remains the same. It comes into the hub VNet and through the Palo Alto firewall through and through the express route gateway uses the connection four to connect to the HLI. But when you do this, it introduces, and of course, uh, before I go there, the on premises will use the same express route global reach connection to connect into the HLI. But when you do this, use remote gateway and allow gateway transit options, you're disabling it. That basically means these SAP spoke units have now no way to connect to on premises because this express route gateway, which is linked to the on premise express route circuit, is no more available to the SAP spoke units to connect over into on premises. So what you have to do is that you have to take the express route gateway in the SAP spoke units and actually use the ER connection three here as shown to link it to the on premise express route circuit. So once you do that, the on premises will be able to talk to the SAP spoke units and likewise the SAP spoke units can talk to the on premises. So this architecture, you know, kind of solves for the problem which we had for the previous, you know, uh, architecture. There is one thing that you got to keep a keep a watch on is that Many customers want the non SAP spoke units talking to SAP spoke units to always go through a Palo Alto firewall, which is great. Your non SAP spoke units use, will use the green bean appearing, come to this firewall, and from the firewall, they talk to the SAP servers in the SAP spoke unit. But the, the return traffic will not take the same path. The return traffic will take 
from the SAP spoke minutes, it'll go through this ER connection to the HLI Express route circuit and through ER connection four, it'll come all the way to the non SAP VNets. Why it happens is because you have this Express route gateway and hub VNet connected to the HLI Express route circuit here, and you also have the Express route gateway here connected to the HLI Express route circuit here. What that means is that this Express route gateway now has learned all of the address spaces which this one has advertised to the HL Express route circuit and likewise whatever is advertised by the SAP spoke minute over here is learned by this Express route gateway. So to avoid that path over here and make sure it goes through the firewall, you just got to add some UDRs to it. So these are the two architectures you know where you got to keep in uh, keep in mind when you're enabling HLI uh, with, v, with VNet integration. There is one more thing I do want to mention. In here, what we are showing is an HLI, which has got HLI database node one and node two deployed uh, in a single zone in VLAN one, uh, and then it's fronted by one uh, HLI express route circuit. But let's say there are customers who would want the HLI to be deployed across two zones uh, for a high availability pattern. So in that, the architecture will slightly, you know, have increased connections, ER connections. For example, you have now HLI deployed in AZ1, which is going to be a, you know, in a VLAN 1, and the HLI in AZ2 cannot be in that VLAN 1. It'll have its own VLAN, a VLAN 2. When you do that, what happens is that now you've got two express route circuits, one front-ending the HLI uh, in VLAN, uh, AZ1 in VLAN 1. The second express route circuit is front-ending the HLI in AZ2 with VL in VLAN 2. Now, when you do that, Whenever the on-premises needs to talk to HLI, you need to have two global reach connections. One a global reach connection to the HLI Express Route Circuit 1 and the other global reach connection to the HLI Express Route Circuit 2. Likewise, when you have, let's say we're using an ER fast path with peered VNets with using the Express Route Gateway and the Hub VNet to connect to HLI, you need to connect two ER uh, fast path connections. Uh, one to the HLI Express Route Circuit 1 and the second to the HLI Express Route Circuit 2. I know it kind of you know gets a little you know um, uh, add-on stuff to it, but that is what you want to keep in mind. The other important construct to note is that typically when you have HLIs in a single zone, then you would uh, use a floating IP across the two nodes uh, to enable the the pacemaker cluster and uh, you know for the HANA database failover and whatnot. When you have HLIs in two separate availability zones, you cannot enable a floating IP like that between two VLANs. You'll have to use a solution called the DNS indirection, which you know will allow you to do a DNS update and manage that with another so that the app servers, when they were there talking to a database, they're actually looking up on a DNS server to find out which node is active. Uh, that is what you will use as a DNS indirection solution and not the floating IP uh, construct that you would use. Basically, uh, I think the subnets are different, meaning the IP would be changed, the virtual IP would be changed. And I think there is a, this block from Ralph Clark we were mentioning in the past about how to do this. And I think it actually was motivated by this, your customer, where we contribute. Yes, work. yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. So in, in, yeah. In, so in a sense, this solution really, you know, was a lot of development effort, you know, put forth as well. So yeah, behind it, but it's a very viable solution out there, you know, and so I think with that, I would conclude that, you know, I think uh, we have gone through some of the complex networking scenarios that yeah. you would see with SAP on Azure workloads. No. I mean, yeah. you, go ahead, go on. No, I'm just thinking it's, it's really, uh, um, it, it for me is always valuable to see concrete customer example. I mean, some customer may do it differently, but also it's always good to see how they did and understand why did they do it. You know, so basically, I'm sure many of those patterns could be applied in a different customers as well. Right. Yeah. Um, Correct. The, the networking architectures presented are very flexible right, and can apply to any SAP and Azure workload uh, design scenario uh, that, that customers are looking to implement in Azure. So I, I do have one question because um, when you walk us through all these blocks, I mean, it's it's very it makes a lot of sense. Um, you, you you talk about the different flows and it's very intuitive, but I'm actually how much time did it take or how much troubleshooting did, did you do that? You are oh, this flow is not working. I cannot ping this virtual machine and oh, this traffic is not routed in a direct way. Did you have a lot of troubleshooting issues there? So, so there is effort in setting up. I think the UDRs was complex, you know, in in some some shape and form. And uh, I've written a blog as well, you know, on this one, you know, uh, which kind of you know, speaks in detail on how we had done the routing and whatnot. Uh, so, but that that is, I think, the, the where the complexity was setting up the user defined routes. And there was, it's not like you know, on day one everything worked. So, you know, obviously yes. we went through uh, with the non uh, you know production environments, and you kind of you know moved up the landscape with Dev and Qate and. You, 
eventually I'm limited in production. So yeah, so it, it, it is something, you know, we got a, a customer should you definitely you know implement in non pro environments and move up. But I think the key thing is, you know, when customers have very stringent security requirements and it is what it is, right? So they need uh, and expect us to, to design solutions that can meet the requirements. So this was, you know, where we kind of, you know, met all the requirements. Sure. Perfect. So I, I really love it. And I think this is a beautiful pattern um, where, where customers that maybe have similar requirements or maybe they just need um, some portions of this. I think that's that's very valuable for, for others to see how this can be done. And then they can also take bits and pieces out of this um, in, in, in yes. their own environment. Sure. Very true. Yeah, totally agree. Cool. Good. Um, Abbas, I think Thank you so much. That was a fantastic run through to, through a very um, detailed, complex to some extent, um, networking infrastructure, security aspects, um, express route. Perfect. So thank you so much for, for coming on to our um, podcast. Uh, I, I think um, I, I'm looking forward to your next customer project <laughs> where you have similar <laughs> complex settings and, and maybe then uh, we can have you again on the show to talk about uh, your, your next project. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think we're, we're also looking at other things, you know, you can continue to improve upon this, this architecture, right? Uh, some of the thought process we are looking into is, you know, what, what all we can do to simplify this architecture further. And then we can probably do another uh, in a podcast on that one. And I think thank you for having me uh, on this call. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.